Uh, as of yesterday, I had something entirely different that I had planned on speaking on. Uh, Pastor White is on vacation today, and so we were printing the bulletin a little later than normal. And I was praying whether or not to change the subject, and I called Melissa and I said, Have you printed the bulletin yet? Because after she prints the bulletin, you know, I hate to, I hate to waste paper, you know, and have to print another one or, or not have the message match the bulletin. She said, well, we've printed the outside, but if you change the sermon, that's on the inside. I said, all right, well, I'll take that as a sign. And so uh, I began to work yesterday on a different message that was on my heart. And uh, the reason for that is I'm talking today about the subject of Israel, more specifically the mystery of Israel. Uh, we have seen the Middle East is in the news once again, and that violence is brewing, and uh, the pundits on the news uh, say that uh, this can be an especially volatile situation. Uh, I was just listening yesterday, as I typically do, to a variety of Christian stations and heard the pastors and commentators talking about the big role of Israel in prophecy. And as they looked at what's happening in the Middle East and then they looked at their Bibles, frankly, it, it broke my heart that there is so much ignorance regarding the biblical place and role of Israel in the Bible and in the work and the Word of God. And I just felt strongly impressed. I looked back over the messages that I've covered in the last few years and I thought, I really haven't talked much about this in, in several years. And, and I'd like to dedicate this message to giving you a little history of what the Bible says about Israel, who they are, what their role is, and what we can expect in the future. So with that background, uh, I think that uh, it is edifying, <clears throat> pardon me, I think it's edifying and appropriate for us to spend some time talking about the role of Israel. Now, I don't think anyone here can deny that Israel seems to be the center of attention uh, quite a bit of the time. When you consider that the land of Israel isn't any bigger than New Jersey. It's about 8,000 square miles, surrounded by Arab enemies on virtually every side. Of course, they've got the Mediterranean on one side, and even in Cyprus, they've got enemies there, and the island's not far away. But it's constantly in the headlines. It is probably one of the most volatile hotspots in the world. It's interesting that this holy territory of Jerusalem is considered to be the holy land by many of the world religions. Of course, the billion Catholics in the world, the 800 million Arabs in the world, uh, the millions of Christians, um, and uh, of course the Jews. These world religions have pilgrimages. They go to Israel, they go to this country, it's their holy land, and perhaps that is part of the reason it is one of the most volatile lands in the world. Jerusalem, the word means city of peace. And that really is a, a paradox, it's a contradiction, because the old Jerusalem is the most embattled city in the world. Wars constantly, they're still to this very day, this morning, I expect they're lobbing missiles at each other between Lebanon and uh, Jerusalem, or at least the northern territory. And it is a very, a very unpeaceful corner of the world. And... Uh, a lot of buildup of military in this country. Now, the Jew, for me, is one of the most interesting subjects and proves the authenticity of the Bible. There are no people in the world that are more persecuted and protected than Jews. And I know there are always new people and visiting and maybe new viewers who are watching that you may not know that I consider myself Jewish not only by blood because my mother was Jewish, but also because, well, I figured that in order to be saved, you've all got to be Jewish anyway. Uh, the Bible is a Jewish book, and uh, those who are saved are grafted into the stock of Israel. So I feel very comfortable talking about these things, both by heritage and by belief and profession. But when you think about it, to this very day, the Jews are a very interesting uh, anomaly in that they are the most protected people the most blessed people, the most persecuted, and the most cursed, all in one. I mean, you go all the way back to the days of Abraham, 
And Abraham, who's considered to be the starting point of the Jewish nation, um, he fled to Egypt because of a famine, had to leave the land that God had called to give him, the promised land. And, uh, but he came back. He made it back to the promised land. Isaac left again because of a famine. He went to Philistia at that time, but he came back again. Jacob had to flee because he was uh, lying to his brother, but he came back again into the promised land. Children of Israel were carried off during the time of Joseph. They, I shouldn't say carried off, but they settled in Egypt. And then the great Exodus story came out of slavery back into the promised land. Because of their unfaithfulness, they were carried off to Babylon. But God worked a series of miracles and brought them back to their territory again. Then, during the time of the Romans, greatly dispersed, and one of the most unique experiences in history that you can hold forth, there is no other people in the world that have been so dispersed and yet remain distinct with their own culture, language, writing, customs, religion, and now, as of 1948, they've got another land called Israel again. They're back again. There is no other country. What's interesting is they were ruled by the Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians don't exist, you know. The people in Egypt today are not the ones who built the pyramids. The Babylonians. You ever heard anyone speak in Babylonian lately? The world empire. They're gone. The Persians. Well, the people in Persia now, they speak uh, they're not Persia, of course. It's Iran and Iraq. They speak Farsi and, and uh, Arabic. The ancient Persian tongue, customs, culture is gone. The, the Greeks, well, there are some people who still speak Greek, but they're not a world empire anymore, are they? And the Romans, well, they did win the World Cup. But uh, ancient Rome is pretty much in ruins. Uh, but the Jews are still a nation. Uh, it, it's really amazing when you think about it even though they've been scattered all over the world. And then you look at, uh, have there ever been people who have been more persecuted? Between 65 A.D. and 135 A.D., the Romans killed approximately 2 million Jews. They were persecuted and driven all over the Roman Empire, beaten everywhere they went. They would have little settlements in all different parts of the globe. That's why you've got a plant called the Wandering Jew. Are you aware that during the Dark Ages, they were also persecuted by, by the church. When the bubonic plague broke out, they blamed the Jewish settlements and they began to persecute the Jews during the Dark Ages. They said that the Black Death, the bubonic plague, was their fault because they were Christ killers. And then, of course, do I need to remind anybody about the Holocaust during World War II where they estimate approximately 6 million, most of them from Poland, Jews were executed uh, in the concentration camps. A persecuted people, but obviously they are people being protected because they still seem to thrive. And there are generalizations about the Jews that I think I can make that has some merit to it. It seems that everywhere they go they do thrive in business. They are tremendous financiers and you look where you will on Wall Street and I tell you I'm related so I know. They are very successful in the banking industry you look at the, uh, the names on the credits, they are the principal writers and in many cases owners of the studios and writers for the studios in Hollywood. Very creative, talented people. Uh, my family was in what they call the rag business. A lot of them were tailors and in the fabric clothing industry. My mother, my aunt uh, were in that business and did very well in that business. And so they seem to thrive. They're blessed in many respects and yet they are also persecuted. Uh, a very interesting people. No people like them in the world. There's no corner of the earth you can go to. They probably have a synagogue in Antarctica. I don't know. But just about every part of the world you can go to today, you will find a Jewish settlement. I was surprised you could go to Mississippi. I mean, you wouldn't think of going to the Bible Belt and finding a Jewish community, but they're everywhere. And yet uh, they've got this a diamond on the planet called Israel that is considered the Holy Land that is a very volatile place and yet like a diamond it seems to endure. What does it all mean? Well first of all I want to remind you that God said in Genesis 15 He told Abraham and this is verse 18 The Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants I have given this land the land of Israel. Uh, 
the origin of Israel really begins with Jacob because the Arabs are descendants of Abraham too. Is everybody aware of that? That most of the Arabs come from both a combination of Ishmael and Esau. The Edomites intermarried with the descendants of Ishmael and that's where you get the Arabs. And of course they all descend from Abraham, that group as well. But the promised land was more specifically given to the son of Isaac called Jacob. Remember when he left the promised land because he had lied, he repented, came back after 20 years with his, his wives and his children, and wrestled with an angel there on the borders of the promised land. And he said when he found out this was a divine messenger, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he was given a new name, Genesis 32 verse 28. Hope you have your pen or your pencil out. And I hope you'll still thumb through your Bible as often as possible and follow me. Genesis 32, 28, Your name will no more, be, no more be called Jacob, which means trickster or deceiver, but Israel, and that means prince with God or overcomer with God. For as a prince you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So the first time the name, the word Israel, appears in the Bible, it is not a country, it's a man. It's one person. Don't forget that because it comes near the end of the message. That's going to come back uh, as we go around here. So it was representing Jacob's new name that he got as a symbol of victory and acceptance. God blessed him. What is the purpose for Israel? Why did God then take these 12 sons of Jacob? He had 12 sons. They became known as the 12 tribes. Now stay with me. Stay with me. There were really 13 tribes. Don't get confused, but stay with me. Jacob had 12 sons. If I tried, I could probably name them all for you, but I won't do that right now. Because Joseph was sold by his brothers, and most of us know that story, when he was reunited with his father, he said, because we've been separated so long, and I'm meeting my grandsons, Manasseh and Ephraim, for the first time, I am going to treat them like my sons, and they will have an equal inheritance. So the two sons of Joseph were treated as tribes in Israel. Their names were Ephraim and Manasseh. Well, that would bring the number to 13. So why don't we say the 13 tribes of Israel? Because Levi was now, once the exodus took place, it was no longer considered a tribe that received an inheritance. They were the priests for all the other 12 tribes. So they still referred to it as the 12 tribes and the Levites, the priests. Did that make sense? But when you start adding them up, you may count 13 because you're counting the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. You leave them out, just count Joseph, you got 12. All right, hopefully that made sense. But um, the purpose for Israel, why did he call them? What was the purpose for them? You read that in Exodus 19, verse 6. When he called them out of Egypt, he said, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They were to be a nation where they were all king priests to be a light to the Gentiles. And again, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter's quoting this, speaking to the church. Don't miss it. Peter's now talking to the church. And he says the same thing God said to Israel. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. It says during the millennium, we live and reign with Christ as kings and priests. Now very simply, this is what it's all about. God wants to save the world. God chose a people in the world and made them the depositories of his truth. He put them in the most prominent piece of geography so they could have the greatest impact on the greatest number of people. He didn't put them in some remote corner of the earth where their light was going to be under a bush. He put them geographically on a land bridge that was a very beautiful land. Tall trees back then. Fertile soil flowing with milk and honey. The land of Israel that we see today is being reclaimed, but it had been deforested for a, a, a number of reasons. One thing that happened to the land of Israel, many times when it was conquered, they cut down the trees. There used to be great forests there. Uh, in addition, the Romans would sow this, when they conquered a country, they would go in and they would sow the fields, the fertile places with salt to destroy its productivity as sort of a vindictive judgment. And then during the... Um, the ages of the, um, the sultans in about 700, 800 AD, there was one sultan there in Israel. He taxed everybody based on how many trees they had on their land. So what would you do? 
If you want to lower your taxes. Everybody cut down their trees. You know why the houses are so narrow in Amsterdam? Because people were taxed based on how much street footage and frontage they had. So their houses were this wide and 10 stories tall to keep the taxes down. Anyway, so that's one reason the promised land looks like a desert in, in many places, but they are planting millions of trees in Israel right now. My grandparents sent a lot of money to plant trees over there, and I expect that they're getting tall by now. Another reason he called them was to be the guardians of the word. Romans chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. What advantage has the Jew then, or what profit is there in circumcision, being part of this covenant? much in every way, chiefly, mainly, primarily, because to them were committed the oracles of God. The oracles being the sacred writings of God. So one of the principal reasons that God called Israel was to be a nation of priests. He committed to them the truth, the, the scriptures, the oracles of God, the sayings of God, that they might distribute that to the others. They were to be a nation of priests. What do priests do? They make atonement for others. If the whole nation is a nation of priests, who are they making atonement for? For the lost Gentiles around them. They were to be bringing others to God. They were to be a light in the world. He put them in this piece of land that was a bridge between Africa and Europe and Asia. All the traffic through the Middle East and Asia and Europe had to go through the Jordan Valley. By the way, it's the lowest point on earth is the Dead Sea at the bottom of the Jordan Valley where John baptized, symbolizing death, burial, resurrection. It's interesting, that's the lowest part, point on the earth. So he committed to them the oracles of truth. Now that's important to remember because I'm going to later talk about spiritual Israel, the church, and you're going to find we have the same job. Now you might be thinking, and this is very important, <clears throat> why are you spending time on this? A lot of the world misunderstands the role of Israel. Their concept of Israel is based upon a lot of faulty prophecies and interpretations. Some of you, you know, and this of course is the stuff that is uh, echoed and repeated by the, the left behind scenario of prophecy. They believe that for one thing, the rebirth of Israel in 1948 is a fulfillment of prophecy. Well, that may, that may be true in part. But then they're looking for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. How many of you have heard that before? Part of the reason for that is because they say the Antichrist must sit in that temple and rule. They expect him to uh, sit in the temple during the tribulation uh, in Jerusalem. And the final battle of Armageddon is when the nations all gather to fight against Israel. And they take that from a prophecy in Zechariah. And it is a complete distortion of the prophecy. If they believe that these prophecies apply to the literal people of Israel, the Jews, that's a big misunderstanding. Not only that, there is an attitude among many evangelical Christians that basically says God is a racist. That God is giving pressure, preferential treatment to the Israelites because they've been blessed and He treats them better than everybody else because of their DNA. Does God treat people better because he examines their genes? Does God treat people better because of their skin color? Or because of what their genetics or their race is? Is God a racist? L let me tell you what the Bible says here on that subject. Acts 10 verse 34, Peter, who used to be a racist, he said, I'm not going to go talk to those Gentiles because they're Gentiles and I don't want to be unclean. And God had to help him get the victory over that. Finally, when he goes to Cornelius, he says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him, and may I add, regardless of their race. But this attitude among the evangelicals, and I'm hearing all of these pastors and say, Pray for Israel. God loves the Jew. He wants to save the Jew. He's got special preference for the Jew. And it almost smacks of racism. Now, I can say that because I'm Jewish. But I don't believe that God shows favoritism to the Jewish people because he looks and says, oh, their ancestors were so and so and so, I've got to show them favor favoritism. Jesus actually says the opposite. John the Baptist says the opposite. They said, we are Abraham's children. And Jesus said, you're of your father the devil. He said, you're not Abraham's children. If you are Abraham's children, you do the works of Abraham. 
So you tell me, how did Jesus identify whose Abraham's children were? The ones who said, you know, we are genetically related to Abraham or the ones who did the works of Abraham? And so God is not a racist. What makes us an Israelite is, by the way, are there examples in the Bible of people who became Israelites that had no Jewish blood? What about Ruth? What about Rahab? And a litany of others that I could name who were absorbed into Israel, but it wasn't based on their blood, it was based on their belief that they were grafted in, so to speak. Uh, furthermore, and I don't want to be, I know that Jews are going to be watching this video, so I want to be gracious, but therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land. God is speaking to Israel. He's not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn and a stiff-necked people. And so this idea that he picked them because they were gooder than everybody else, no, he said, I actually picked you because you were better than everybody else to show that I'm gracious. Actually, they're like everybody. We're all stubborn and stiff-necked, aren't we? And so this idea that we're picked because they were better or superior, that's not biblical. He says, I picked you because you were the least of all nations to show his grace. God often chooses the, the low things. He chooses the humble things to show his goodness. And so there's just a whole inverted concept of who spiritual Israel is. So what does the Bible say about spiritual Israel then? Does God still have an Israel in the world today? And all the blessings and the promises for Israel, are they based on your genes or are they based on your faith? And when I say genes, I don't mean Levi's and Wrangler. I'm talking about are they based on your genetics on your DNA or are they your heritage, your grandparents? Or are the blessings of God based upon your faith? Let's read what the Bible says. Romans, and this is written by a Jew, by the way. Of course, the whole Bible is written by Jews with the exception of Nebuchadnezzar wrote one chapter in Daniel and uh, Luke, who was not a Jew. Everything else is written by a Jew. Okay? Romans chapter 2, verse 28. Paul says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, meaning in the flesh, nor circumcision, that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is in the heart. It is the spiritual covenant in the heart. It is not the physical that makes us a Jew. During the time of the Holocaust, uh, it was very interesting in, in Nazi Germany, and I've, I've read a lot about the, the era they would try to identify who were the Jews because a lot of Jews were living in Nazi-occupied Europe back then who did not, they did not wear their religion on their sleeve and they didn't advertise it and so they tried to find out how they could tell if you were a Jew. And it happened if you had a large nose or if you had a hooked nose and what they thought was a little bit distinctive, you could have been from France and had absolute, you could have been related to the king of France that had no Jewish blood, but they might arrest you based on your nose. If you were circumcised, and it may have been for health reasons that had nothing to do with religious convictions, you were in big trouble. And so they had all this criteria of trying to separate, but it was all physical, external. Of course, if there were papers, and that would do it too. They never asked, what is your faith? They, they want to know what the blood is, and they, they wanted to have the Aryan race because it was superior. That was the ultimate age of racism right then. And exterminate everybody else because they were considered inferior but it was based on the flesh. God is not going to do it that way, but you know God is going to save people based on their race. Spiritual race. If they are not spiritually Jews, it doesn't matter what you've got going for you physically. You see what I'm saying? You've got to be part of that spiritual nation to be saved. Somebody's going to take that quote out of context and get me in trouble. Romans 9 verse 6. But it was not that the word of God has taken no effect. Romans 9, verse 6 and 7. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. They're not all Israel who are of Israel. You could be living in the middle of the land of Israel. You could have been there for generations. All your parents and grandparents and great-great-grandparents all the way back could have been Jews. And Paul could still say they are not all Israel who are of Israel nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. Isn't this clear? Am I making this up or is this what the Bible says? But in Isaac your seed shall be called. Isaac was a type of Christ. The son of Abraham who was offered on the mountain. 
It's in Christ the seed is called. Galatians 3 verse 7, if you have doubts about that. Galatians 3 verse 7, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Not some of those who are of faith. Only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. That means there may be some who are related to Abraham, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or an Arab. Arabs are sons of Abraham too, you know. But they are not the children of God if they are not sons of faith. God saves us based on what? Faith. Here's the slam dunk scripture, but I'll have more after it. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. God does not save us based on our gender. He does not save us based on our race, based on our nationality, based on our employment, slave or free. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And then catch this. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you are Christ, then you become a spiritual Jew. And all of the promises in the Bible for the Jews belong to you. But I'm not done. This is why James writes in James chapter 1 verse 1, to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad. When James writes his letter to the church, and he addresses it to the twelve tribes. What twelve tribes are there? Were there still twelve tribes that were scattered abroad when James wrote his letter? No. Ten of the tribes, they've been carried off. Matter of fact, let's go to that now. Where, what, you ever heard of the ten lost tribes? How many of you have heard of the ten lost tribes? Do you realize that our Mormon friends believe that the ten lost tribes were the North American Indians? How many of you are aware of that? If you read the Book of Mormon, that's what they say. This, the people of the Americas and were populated largely from the ten lost tribes. Some of them came across the ocean and populated the Americas, and Jesus came to them again, made a second coming over here to the Americas. You weren't aware of that? The, the Mormon church is in crisis right now because DNA, they deny the, the, the validity of any DNA science. They said the whole thing's a hoax because DNA very clearly shows that the North American Indians are most closely related to the people of Mongolia today. And I believe it's true. I believe it's a fairly accurate science. I remember when uh, I worked on the Navajo reservation for a year and a half and my next door neighbors were some Navajos and praise God we baptized them. And I remember one day Tim McCabe came over and he was talking to me and he's smiling. He says, Pastor Doug, he says, I got good news. He says, what's that, Tim? He says, you and I were brothers. I said, well, I already knew that. No, I said, I don't mean spiritual brothers. He says, we're physically related. I said, well, I knew that too because we both come from Adam. And we both come from Noah. He said, no, but even closer than that. He says, I'm a Jew. And he was smiling. He said, some Mormon missionaries just left and they told me I'm Jewish. <laughs> and uh, and he, said, he just laughed. He said, you know, I'm no fool. He said, I was in Vietnam. Tim happened to have been in Vietnam. And he said, uh, I know I look a whole lot more like those people than I look like you, Doug. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, the, the ten tribes, what happened to them? You can read it in the Bible. I mean, just an elementary reading of the Bible tells you what happened. Second Kings chapter 17, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of, uh, he was the king of Israel, the king of Assyria took Samaria. That was the capital of the northern empire where the ten tribes were and carried Israel away to Assyria. Israel did not bounce back like the Jews from Judah. That's where you get the word Jew. The Jews are the relatives and descendants from the tribes of Judah. It's a shortened version of that. The ten tribes, when they were conquered from Assyria, they didn't come back like the Jews came back from the Babylonian captivity. Most of them were intermarrying with the Assyrians. Some of them came back and were called Samaritans. They were some of the tribes who had intermarried with the Samaritans and tried to mingle the religion, and the Jews said, we're not going to have anything to do with you. You're no longer pure. And today someone said there's only about 50 real Samaritans left in the land of Israel. They're, they're just about disappeared as a people. What does that say about the 144,000 that you read in Revelation chapter 7 and 14. Are they 12,000 from the literal 12 tribes of Israel? Or is it talking about spiritual Israel? Spiritual Israel, of course it is. Because you're not going to find 12,000 people who have any kind of purity in their bloodline from the tribes of Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali and those that are mentioned there in Revelation. 
And if you're going to say there are 12,000 who have the actual particles of the blood from these tribes, you're probably all included anyway because they've been so dispersed and intermarried it doesn't really matter. See what I'm saying? Those, and I met a friend. He was of Arab blood and he said we're related to the 12 tribes. He was from Iran. He said, yeah, I can date my family all the way back to the 10 tribes that were carried off to Assyria. But he said, yeah, of course we've intermarried with the Arabs and I look like an Arab. And so they don't have, they, they lost their identity, they lost their culture, their distinction, but not the Jews. They remain distinct. Amos chapter 5 verse 27, Therefore I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. God did not say to the ten tribes what he later said to the Jews. Oh, I'm going to cause you to go into captivity and bring you back again. He didn't do that for Israel. He did it for Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Keep in mind, there were 13 tribes. Ten of the tribes went to the north. The Levites, who were the priests, Benjamin, the younger brother of Joseph, and Judah, they stayed around Judah and Jerusalem, Bethlehem. That was the southern kingdom, ruled by um, the, the kings of Rehoboam and beyond. Now, but Doug, didn't God say that he's blessed the promised land, that geography over there in Israel? Didn't he give that to Abraham and his descendants? And doesn't that belong to the Jews today? Well, I do believe that they have arguable rights to that territory, but that is not really the promised land that God has promised. It was for the literal Jews in Bible times. He gave them that land. He brought them over. But they've been dispossessed several times. The ultimate promised land is still yet to come. It's the heavenly Canaan. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. And of course, the book of Hebrews is written to Hebrews. It's written to Jews. By faith, he, Abraham, dwelt in the land of promise. He dwelt in the promised land as in a foreign country. He did not dwell in the promised land as though it was his home. He dwelt in the promised land knowing it was passing. It was only a symbol. Because let's face it. However long you happen to live on the top side of this land, do you ever really get to enjoy eternal life in this land? Is this the land that you're looking forward to? Eh, well, it's not going to be very long, is it? I mean, I want something better, don't you? He dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, saying all the patriarchs treated the promised land as a foreign country. They did not build a palace in the promised land because they said this is only a symbol. We're getting our mansion in the real promised land. For he waited for a city, speaking of the New Jerusalem, that have foundations whose builder and maker is God. They were looking ahead to the promised land as the spiritual fulfillment. Hebrews 11 verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So do we have a promised land in this world? We're strangers and pilgrims. Do you think very many people are enjoying the land of milk and honey in Israel right now, we got as much milk and honey in California as they got there. That's right. I mean, you're going to say they got that much advantage over there? Oh, they got all the stress and, and strain of living surrounded by enemies that would like to just blow them. What do you think Iran would do if it gets a nuclear first target? What do you think the first target of Iran's nuclear weapon, if they get one, would be? You get one guess. They've announced it, basically. And who do you think it is that's funding Hezbollah? Syria? Iran? Is it really a land of rest? No. By the way, a little amazing fact. When you look at the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, 375 miles on each side, and it says Abraham looked for a city. Well, there was no city in the promised land he was looking for back then. He was looking ahead to the New Jerusalem. By the way, where did Abraham pay his tithe? He gave his tithe to a king priest by the name of Melchizedek, and that name means king of righteousness, and he lived in a place called Salem. Abraham gave his tithes to a king priest in Salem, later known as Jerusalem, named Melchizedek, king of righteousness, who brought out bread and wine, a symbol of the new covenant. That's all telling us he's looking forward to the new Jerusalem. The dimensions of the new Jerusalem 1,500 miles around, 375 miles on each side, and it says it's going to come down where? Zechariah 14 comes down on 
the Mount of Olives. Jesus said, I'm going the way I came. He ascended up from the Mount of Olives. He's coming back after the thousand years to the Mount of Olives. The new Jerusalem is going to settle down in a valley that will be created there. Do you realize what will be within the boundaries of that new Jerusalem? The exact dimensions of the land that God promised to Abraham. I don't know if I put this in my notes or not. But if you look in your Bible, you will find that when God promised the promised land to Abraham, it was to reach from the river of Egypt to the mountains of Lebanon to the Euphrates River on the east to the Mediterranean. That's a lot more than Israel has today. And you just watch the war break out if Israel tries to take the land all the way to the Euphrates. The only way they're going to get that is when the New Jerusalem settles down on that territory. That's going to be when they really get the promised land. And you and I inherit that heavenly Canaan. Amen? Now, the Bible says there are advantages to being a Jew. Let me read that to you. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it's not because of their race. Listen carefully. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone has an opportunity for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And the word Greek there means Gentile. The, the Greeks were the ones who kind of surrounded them. Uh, Alexander the Great had conquered the world. He was Greek and they called a lot of the Gentiles, they called them Greek. You ever heard the expression that says, that's Greek to me? That goes all the way back to the Jews when they would say, <laughs> you know, oh, that's what Alexander spoke. Um, the Jew first also to the Gentile. Matthew 10 verse 5, when Jesus sent them out preaching, what did he say? Do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans. They're even half Jews. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did Jesus say to preach to the Jews first? Let me give you another one. Acts 13, I'm not going to answer my question yet. Acts 13 46. And Paul and Barnabas grew bold and they said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. They were preaching to the Jews in a synagogue. It was necessary the word of God should be spoken to you first. But seeing that you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul said we should go to you first. Now, why the Jew first? It's a practical reason. If you're doing evangelism, and uh, there's a certain amount of knowledge a person needs to accept Christ. There's something they need to be taught. Go ye therefore teach all nations. Some people have already got 75% of the knowledge. Some people need 100%. They don't know anything. Where would you start if you were going to do evangelism to get the quickest results? With those who have no background or with those who have 75% knowledge? Obviously, the best place to preach the gospel would be with the ones who already knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've got the whole foundation of the Old Testament. You go to them first, you're going to have the quickest results by going to them first. And when I do evangelism, who do you think are the first ones that I'm able to revive and reach? People with a Christian background. They've already got some fundamentals. You don't have to... I've done evangelistic meetings before where I've had someone come up to me and they say, Who's Moses? I mean, you know, typical people in even a pagan culture know something about Joseph and David and Goliath. But I've done evangelism before where they've just never even heard these names. It's a lot more fruitful working with the people who've got some background because you don't have to teach them as much. So you go to them first. And so that's why it was more practical. Who is going to understand who, what a Messiah is? If you've got to go to folks who don't even know what a Messiah is, but if you go to the Jews, you can tell them who the Messiah is because they already know what a Messiah is, right? So you go to the Jews first. It was a very practical reason. To whom much is given, much is required. They already had a lot of knowledge. They have first opportunity. And just that's the reason for that. It wasn't because of their race that they had some special privilege. They just were the furthest down the road and were going to be the most fruitful. Pentecost. Who gets baptized at Pentecost first? Acts chapter 2. There were dwelling in Jerusalem devout Jews out of every nation. Oh, what a brilliant thing for the Lord to do. And, and I don't mean that to be disrespectful to call the Lord brilliant, but it really is a brilliant plan. Wait for this holiday when what kind of Jews? Devout Jews who are willing to make a pilgrimage from all over the Roman Empire, all their different nations where they live, speaking all the different languages, and they come to Jerusalem, give the disciples the ability to communicate the gospel to them very quickly because they've already got the background in their languages they then take it and they spread the news about Jesus all around to all the Jewish communities around the Roman Empire 
And then it went from the Jewish communities and spread to the Gentiles. That's a brilliant plan. What a way to do evangelism. That's how we should do it. That's why in my advertising I put little catchwords in that will get the attention of Christians. People who may have Christian background. Because they're going to have the most fruitful, fertile soil to do that kind of evangelism. To the Jew first. But we're not saved based on our genetics, are we? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 8? This Roman centurion said, please heal my servant. Jesus said, all right, I'm on my way to heal your servant. Christ is en route. The Roman centurion sends back a message. He said, you don't even need to come under my roof. He said, um, just speak the word and uh, he'll be healed. And Jesus said, wow, I haven't seen this faith in all of Israel. And Christ goes on to say, assuredly I say to you, I've not found such great faith. And this is Matthew 8, verse 10. Assuredly, I say, I have not found such great faith, no, not even in Israel. And I say to you, listen carefully to the words of Christ, many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were considered the ultimate patriarchs for the Jews. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. Woo! You think that was going to get Jesus reelected? That's not a popular thing to say. Matter of fact, just about every time when Christ was nearly killed, you know what almost got him killed? The idea that salvation was not just for the Jews. In Nazareth, he starts his ministry by saying, there were many lepers in the land of the days of Naaman, but Naaman was not sent to any of them, but to a, uh, I'm sorry, there were many lepers in the land in the days of Elisha. But Elisha wasn't allowed to heal any of them, but a Syrian. I want to be popular to say that right now in Israel. And then he goes on and he says, there were many widows in the land in the days of Elijah. But Elijah wasn't sent to any Jewish widows. He was sent to a Canaanite widow. And that angered them so much they almost threw him off a cliff in Nazareth. What? You mean, we're the chosen people. We're the ones who are to be saved. What do you think the parable of the rich man and Lazarus was supposed to say? Rich man feasting in his palace sumptuously every day while the poor beggar lays at his gate wanting the crumbs that fall from his table. That rich man was the Jewish nation. Had this incredible treasure of truth but they were hoarding it and gorging on it while people around them were starving. And by the way, if you eat too much of even the best food you get sick. And if we spend all our time dissecting the word among ourselves without doing evangelism, you can't be healthy. The same thing that Jesus said to Israel, he says to the church. If we just cloister ourselves in our churches and say, we're insulated, praise the Lord, we're saved, and we feast in our personal Bible studies, and we don't reach those who are laying at our gate desiring the crumbs that we're talking about, then we may find those people out there are going to be in the kingdom and we're going to be in Hades. That was the message of that whole parable, that God is not going to save us just because we've been given the message of truth. We've got to be willing to share it. Many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom. You know the parable Jesus told about this fruitless fig tree. Remember Jesus cursed the fig tree because it had leaves and no fruit. What did that represent? That fig tree represented the nation of Israel. A certain man had a tree planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit on it and he found none. And he said, give it more time. The owner was going to say, cut it down. And the gardener said, let's irrigate it. Let's fertilize it. We'll prune it and maybe it'll bear fruit. If not, cut it down. Well, what happened in 70 AD? It was cut down as a nation. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, Matthew 21, 43, will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits. What nation is it now that is to bear the fruits of the Spirit? It is a royal nation, Peter says, a holy nation. That's you and me. We become a new nation, ambassadors of another kingdom, spiritual Israel. Amen? We are Zion today. God has a spiritual Zion, and that is the church. Oh, Pastor Doug, but what about the temple being rebuilt? I mean, everyone's talking about the temple being rebuilt. You know where the temple, they want to rebuild the temple. They want to rebuild the temple on the old location where Abraham supposedly offered on Mount Moriah, Isaac. It was the threshing floor of Ornan where David interceded when the plague was going through Israel and David prayed on this very same spot. 
And the later Solomon's temple was built there. It was destroyed. Nehemiah and Ezra, they built their temple there. It was destroyed by the Romans. Now the Mosque of Omar is there. I've been there. What do you think is going to happen in the Arab world if the Jews try to disassemble that in any way and build a temple there? Just think about this. Be real. I mean, talk about being suicidal. Every Arab will make a vow of kamikaze. If they try to, this is one of their, I think uh, they have the three holy spots and this is one of the top three holy spots for the Jewish people. I'm sorry, the, for the Arabs, the Islamic people. This idea they're going to rebuild the temple. But doesn't the Bible say, wait a second here, there's a scripture that says that, that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God. And in order for the Antichrist to sit in the temple of God, let me read that to you. And they're going to have to rebuild it, right? Second Thessalonians, this is the only verse so often misunderstood. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means. Talking about the son of perdition, the Antichrist coming. For that day will not come unless there comes a falling away first, meaning a falling away in the church. The world's already fallen. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. So, catch this, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. If the temple being spoken of here is a literal Jewish temple, then yeah, they need to rebuild the temple. But if the Bible teaches there's another kind of temple, maybe it's talking about something else. When Christ died on the cross, what happened in the temple? The veil was ripped from top to bottom. Daniel 9 says he'll cause the sacrifice to cease. Where's the temple today? Remember what Jesus said, John 2:19. Destroy this temple that is made with hands and in three days I will raise it up. And he spoke of his body. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the temple of God. Ephesians 2.20 Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building joined together grows into a holy temple. The church grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are being built together. What don't you know? Ye are the temple of God, Paul says. 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as living stones are being built up to a spiritual house. What kind of temple is there now? So this Antichrist power, where does he sit? He sits over the church of God, in the place of God, saying he has the power to forgive sin, saying he's in the place of God. Has that been fulfilled? Yeah, the Antichrist has already played his hand on that one. So this idea of all these evangelical Christians who are waiting for the mosque of Omar to get bulldozed, do you realize that some Protestant Christian actually snuck in there and tried to blow it up, thought that he'd help accelerate the pro prophecy, got arrested. Um, Jews are really scared about some of the evangelicals. They're, they're going to create an incident because of this pro-Israel stand. And I'm pro-Israel, don't misunderstand. I am. Uh, I've been there twice. I'm very thankful for my Jewish heritage. But the, biblically, there's a lot of misunderstandings. Nathan the prophet said to David in, I think it's uh, 1 Chronicles 17, after you go and rest with your fathers, your son who shall come after you, he will build me a house that will last forever. Well, Nathan was talking partly about Solomon who would build the next temple, but especially he was talking about the son of David called Jesus who was to build a house that was to last forever. Jesus is a carpenter. He built a house. You're the house he built. You are the house that Jesus built. That's right. We are the temple of God. We are the body of Christ. He said, destroy this temple. Three days I'll raise it up. He spoke of his body. So, are, are we supposed to be waiting for the Antichrist to sit in some Jewish building? It's a big deception. Not understanding Israel is setting the world up for the big deception. Now, as Paul would say in Hebrews, now what's the sum of what I want to say? Ultimately, who is Israel today? Well, I've already told you, you are the body of Christ, meaning that Christ is Israel. Remember when Israel, the name was first given, it was given to a person, Jacob, one man. Notice the similarities between Christ and Israel. In Psalms 80, God calls Israel a vine. In John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine. Are you staying with me? In Exodus 4.22, God calls Israel my firstborn. In Colossians 1.15, Jesus is called the firstborn. Paul calls, um, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 41 verse 8, Israel is called the seed of Abraham. Israel is. But Jesus in Genesis 3.15 is called the seed of the woman that would destroy the serpent's head. 
In Isaiah 41, Israel is called my servant. But then the prophecy about Christ in Isaiah 41 verse 8, it says that Jesus is the suffering servant. I'm sorry, I got them backwards. Isaiah 41 8, Israel is called the servant. Isaiah 42 verse 1, Jesus is called the servant. And then of course, how many of you remember when um, God prophesied, out of Egypt I have called my son. Israel was called his son, brought out of Egypt. After Jesus was brought to Egypt as a baby, and then they brought him back into the promised land, Matthew quoted that, referring to Jesus, and said, out of Israel I have called my son. So you'll find over and over in the Bible, the prophecies and the promises, the characteristics that were used to identify Israel are synonymous with Christ. So, who is a Jew? Whoever accepts Christ, they are Abraham's seed. Now, Pastor Doug, what are you saying? That nothing in the Bible, none of these prophecies have anything to do with literal Jews? No, there's still a lot there for them. Go with me to the book of Romans. I want to read this entire passage to you um, right out of the Bible. because, And I want to go to Romans 11, verse 13. What is God's role for Israel today? What do I think is going to happen prophetically with them? Don't you want the answer to this? Romans 11:13. And stay with me, I'm going to read a few verses. For I speak to you Gentiles, that would be most of you here. How many of you here have actual Jewish blood? Let me see. Just wondering. Esther, got a couple of us here. Oh, about six or eight of us here, okay? We're outnumbered, so let's be on our best behavior. <laughs> So, I'm speaking to the Gentiles here. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I might provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. In other words, Paul's saying, look, if I can make my Jewish brothers be jealous to be Christians, and that's what I want to do. And I feel exactly the same way. For if they're being cast away, were they cut off out of the land of Israel? Was the tree cut down? Yes, it was. But remember this dream of Nebuchadnezzar? The stump was left. What a miracle that after 1900 years they got their land back. No other example of that anywhere on the planet. That's phenomenal. For if be, after being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? They can still be accepted as a nation, Paul saying. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. Every Christian is grafted into the root of Israel. The Old Testament is all the promises of Israel, okay? And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree are grafted in, some of the natural branches were broken off because of unbelief. You still all agree with me? No fruit? Cut it down. If some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, the Gentiles, were grafted in and among them, and you've become partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Whenever you read your Old Testament, and all the promises of Christianity are rooted in the olive tree of Israel. We become spiritual Jews. Do not boast against the branches. If you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You're supported by the Jews. I could never understand an anti-Semitic Christian. That's like hating your own foot. Because you can't stand as a Christian unless you stand on Israel. That just never makes sense to me. You will then say, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. I'm better because they didn't believe. Yeah. Verse 20, they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty or fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, because of unbelief, He may not spare you either. If they were the natural blood and faith, you're only by faith. Uh, then we better be careful not to boast against the Jews. <laughs> Otherwise, you can be cut off. Therefore, consider, uh, verse 22, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity towards you goodness. If you continue in His goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Did you get that? The same thing that happened in the Jewish nation. Paul says, These things are written for our admonition on whom the ends of the earth have come. 1 Corinthians 10. All that happened to them is a, is a parallel of what will happen with the church. Many of us have repeated the history of stubbornness that they manifested. Stay with me. And I love this part. 
Verse 23, And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. You know, I personally believe there's going to be a revival among the Jews. Does that mean that every Jew is going to be saved? No. And some people have misunderstood this. Paul says, verse 26, jump down. So all Israel will be saved. Now, many people have quoted that and said, all Israel is going to be saved. Is God going to save all Jews? Or all spiritual Israelites, whether Jew or Gentile, all spiritual Israel will be saved. Isn't that true? That's what he's talking about. But some have read this to mean that everybody who can say I'm Jewish on their birth certificate, they've got to be saved. Does God save people based on that? That just totally tortures the teaching of the Bible. But if they are grafted into the olive tree because of belief, they will be saved. God says God is able to graft them back in again. I think there's going to be a great revival among the Jews. And I've got a special burden for that. That's one reason Amazing Facts went to New York City. Uh, principal religions there were Catholic, Jewish was number two, more than Protestants. And we, we just had a, a burden for our Jewish brothers. Best preachers are Jews and blacks, in my opinion. And if we could just get, you know why? They've all been slaves. They can understand deliverance. And boy, if we could get an army of Jewish preachers uh, to catch on fire. And so I think that, that, you know, God has a special burden. I also think there's some significance to what's happening in the Middle East now that I can't completely understand. I'm getting a little off my subject, but let me just say something to you. If you read the last few words in Daniel chapter 11, it talks about a great conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south, and it specifically says Edom, Ammon, Moab, Egypt, Libya. I just named five Arab countries today. Uh, and you can't help but wonder if there are some parallels between the last day events and this. Uh, there are a lot of dear Islamic people, but there's also, let's admit, a fringe of Islam that is very extreme. And you wonder what that role is going to be in prophecy. I do think we're living in very interesting times. Uh, and when you're watching the headlines and wondering what's going on with Israel, I hope that you include yourself because if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And we need to be praying for those people in that land and praying for everybody to be grafted into the stock of Israel. Amen?